one of our friends on on the X, Tartaria, they said they've got 7,500 books on Tartaria alone. There's a lot of people out there that have the questions, want answers, but who do you turn to? Academia is useless when it comes to this stuff. Think about uh, Christopher Columbus in Canada. They have a exact replica of one of the ships and on the mast was Tartaria. But back in the past, we had points of energy. This is where Tartaria came in as mm. well, right? They were able to heat large buildings with yeah. antenna up in the air. Welcome to History Hacked, your gateway to uncovering history's most mysterious and controversial conspiracies that will make you question everything you thought you knew about history. Dive into hours of mind-bending video content at historyhacked.com and visit historyhacked.com shop to pick up some of the best Tartarian fashion and accessories this side of the empire. Subscribe to this channel and stay connected on X at History Hacked. Now fasten your seatbelt for a journey through the unknown. Godspeed. Today's guest is professional stock trader, financial writer, and alternative history researcher, J.B. Sleer. With over 15 years of experience in stocks and commodities trading, JB is the founder of Fort Wealth Trading Company. Beyond finance, JB's journey includes a deep interest in the Christ story, extensive Bible studies, and an exploration of historical facts through Anatoly Fomenko's seven-volume series titled History, Fiction, or Science. Good to have you back on the show, JB. Thank you. Glad to be here. Wow. Now, JB, we talked about a year ago, and uh, whoever is listening who has not seen that, go watch that interview because it was great. And it's a good sort of introduction for people who are not familiar with Anatoly Fomenko or the new chronology. But if you're just tuning into this and you don't know what that is, JB, can you give us a, an elevator pitch of the new chronology? Okay, what we're finding out is that our history was nowhere near the facts and what has happened is with the collapse of Russia, the collapse of the Communist Party, we have a whole treasure trove of new data that has come in and has been brought and translated into English that is now challenging what we have been taught. Uh, they've utilized mathematics and various sciences to help prove their thesis that it, it is more correct, their timelines are more correct than ours could ever be including the starting of our country, the starting of South America, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, the idea that they had people from Tartaria coming over here. And I'm jumping over that. Uh, that's not what Anatoly Fomenko talks about. but and, and they're doing their very best not to talk about Tartaria. You know, it's all about mm. Russia, but they yeah. can't escape this. You know, so I don't believe anything that comes from a, a history book that was written in English. I, I just can't believe it. Um, and the facts that Anatolia has brought forward uh, convinced me that what I've read was fiction. And basically, the big nugget that, uh, that he leaves you with is that 6,000 years of presumed history was likely condensed within the past thousand years, with most of it occurring with this huge empire, you know, we call it Tartaria. Flamenco, I think in his work, calls it the, the Horde with the Mongols, which he actually kind of goes into the difference between what the Mongols were, the Horde and Tartaria, which we'll get into. But basically, when you talk about Egypt, you're talking about even ancient Sumer, ancient Rome and Greece, that these stories that we think are thousands of years old originally occurred within a time frame that's probably a few hundred years and only about a thousand to 500 years from our present time. So it's a radical different uh, way of looking. And a lot of people cannot even get over that. It's just so, so alien to sort of everything we've been taught that there's a lot of sort of backlash to, uh, there's been a lot of backlash to Fomenko within his own community. We get a lot of crap for talking about this. And I'm sure we just bring it up with your relatives at, at Thanksgiving. It's gonna, gonna get a lot of stares. And a lot of people think you're lost your mind. Yeah, I'm used to it. I don't know about yeah. you guys. <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've, I've enjoyed what I've read history-wise, and I, I can't explain why um, I've delved into the Christ story for so long. Mm -hmm. But I'm amazed by, the, uh, by the, his popularity 
and more so even in the books that were taken out of the Bible, um, talk about Christ's youth, talks about all these things that he's done, even as a child, the miracles that occurred around him. And uh, then the idea that Anatoly brought up that he was crucified 1195 AD, our time. Yeah, I think 1185 is the, I think is the date. He, so uh, Pomeco puts the personage of Christ as as the, the original of him is the Byzantine emperor, Adronicus Komnenos I, who ruled in uh, Zagreb or where modern day Istanbul is from 1152 to 1185 when he was, I'm sorry, he was born in 1152. He ruled from 1182 to 1185 when he uh, was dethroned and uh, I guess crucified as well. And there's a lot of parallels between the story of uh, the Byzantine emperor Adronicus and Christ that uh, I definitely love to unpack. And you know, he was a king. They were they were threatened by the king of Israel, mm -hmm. and the okay. So most recently, you guys was it you guys that came up with the that okay? We know that he was born in, in Constantinople, or he was crucified in Constantinople, and possibly born in Crimea. Kate Fiolent, Fiolent, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That was amazing because it does fit within what Anatoly had written about Moses and the army that he had traveling through the wilderness. Yes, and another great thing about the nativity as far as Fomenko's work on it is actually he uh, he identifies the three magi as uh, he identifies their medieval duplicates. And I think uh, one of the magi, uh, what's, what's the Malchior, name? Malchior, the female. Yeah, Malchior was a female. And yeah. if you look in a lot of, of older Christian drawings, probably before the 1600s, what you see, we have some examples he puts the uh, the person is Princess Malka, who is the mother of Prince Vladimir, who is Balthazar. And the third one was actually a commander, a Kozak commander. It's a woman, could be a feminine man, but you see a theme that it's one of these magi is very female looking. And well, she had breasts too. Yeah, yeah. There's um, a lot of the painting. This, this so. one is this example. She's a little androgynous uh, with the low cut dress. Yeah, yeah. Then here's yeah. a here's a better one. Here's the three of them in bed together. Together, I don't know what yes. this is about. <laughs> and what's funny is that you find a lot of uh, depictions of the nativity with an, a black man. And after I read Fomenko, you notice that every time you see this uh, black man, it is kind of very feminized. But even the names, those names were mentioned in Old Testament or in, in books that were not part of the, uh, what we call the King James Version uh, of the Bible now. These names were discussed in... Uh, books that were cast out. So uh, I've not been able to prove that Christ is the son of God, uh, but be able to prove that this person was around and those stories around him uh, were very famous. And he was a king. He was a king. I mean, uh, it seems like we, uh, Christianity these days has a sort of a uh a very kind of childlike view of, of the nativity time where they, you see all these images of, of Jesus and he's in rags and all his followers are in rags and they were, they were kind of poor and wandering through the desert. But the way history works is you really don't get your story written unless you were part of the royalty. And Jesus was part of the royalty. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about as, um, as he was a reflection of the Byzantine emperor Adronicus. These were three wise people that came with gifts bearing gold, myrrh, treasures. Mary's not going to leave that there. They're, you know, right off the bat, they were wealthy. So we actually know a lot about um, sort of the life of uh, Andronicus through a person who was there, a guy named Nikitas Kodiatis. He was actually a contemporary of Andronicus. He was in Zagreb, and he wrote the most detailed chronicles of Andronicus. And these, the sort of parallels that go on with the story of Christ and the story of Andronicus are pretty, pretty insane. Uh, so, King of the Slobs. I think that's the mm, book you're, you're talking about. You know, I didn't read that book, but, uh, but Fomenko has been giving a series of interviews where uh, him and his partner have been discussing this in detail and showing some of the, um, some of the excerpts from Nikita Kodiani's his chronicles that oddly parallel the story that we've been told about Christ. For example, as a young man, uh, Jonicus sort of wandered through various countries before taking the throne, parallel with Jesus uh, going to Egypt. Uh, in Fomenko's version, uh, Andronicus 
Christ, he went up to Russia to his sort of ancestral homeland, kind of the the area where he had the most supporters. And then in his um, early 30s, took the throne in Tsargrad. And that's when the events of the New Testament, the uh, the crucifixion, um, biblical, all the, all the stuff of him coming into biblical Jerusalem take place, where it's actually Tsargrad, Constantinople in the 1100s. You know, I can add to some of the travels of Andronicus, well, of Christ, if you will, because he had, uh, from some of the readings that we have, uh, the lost chapter of the book of Acts, the 29th or 28th, 29th chapter, um, they talk about Paul visiting Great Britain. And that was a place where Brutus and the team were all uh, left over there. Christ, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, his uncle, Christ's uncle, took him everywhere. And like on one of the ancient maps Anatoly Kamenko had brought up was uh, the island of Isu in Japan, which sounds just like Yesu. And, you know, the, uh, the Christian name for Jesus. There's also uh, uh, inside the Scottish Declaration of Independence, and the Scots were furious about truth. They're, um, as sure as our Lord has visited the islands, is in that. I've got that somewhere in my collection. Um, but Joseph of Arimathea was a, a sea merchant. He traveled the world. So why not visit England? Why not go to Fiji? Why not go to uh, all the, the nations and the points of interest that were not European uh, or not the Roman Empire, if you will? So, yeah, um, I think Jesus was a traveler. And when, when, he, yeah, when, he, when he assumed the throne, it was... It, so this is the... Uh, I don't have the quotes. I'll put them up on the screen, actually. He describes Christ as very intelligent and very cunning, and um, he was loved by the poor people, but the nobility hated him. He did a lot of reforms. He was uh, associated with miracles, like uh, walk through walls and stuff, but the common people, the working people, they love him, but the nobility that was making money off the way things were hated him, and and Codiades was part of this nobility. And if you read the uh, sort of wiki on Andronicus, there's a lot of stuff about him being a tyrant and all that stuff. He doesn't have a good reputation, but there's a lot of documents saying that he was loved by a, sort of the common people. It's ironic how we're still living in that. It's interesting, you know, isn't it? It's... <laughs> <laughs> Have we ever stopped the battle? Yeah, it's amazing. Andronicus, Christ, um, he was uh, famous with the people. And when he was crucified, when he was murdered, it started a, the Great Crusade. It was a world war. And it happened within a year's time, within a couple of years' time, instead of a, you know, like a thousand-year wait period that we're that is claimed to have happened now. Yeah, I mean, so it's all kind of one big family, and there was a family adjacent to the Camados called the Angelos family uh, that led the rebellion against Christ. And Fumeko makes the parallel between the Angelos and Angels, who this family normally served the emperor, served the king. I think one of Jesus' cous cousins or something, Isaac Angelos, was the one who initiated the rebellion. And Fumeko claims that this was the inspiration for the Satan figure, uh, the rebel angel. He also says this Isaac Angelos character is the same person as Emperor Seti I, which is sort of a lot of parallels between the, the Satan and Seti as well. Because according to another crazy thing coming out of the new chronology is the story of Egypt and how the cons of this empire were the pharaohs buried in the Valley of Kings. And it said he was not a pharaoh of just Egypt or the Egyptian empire, but he was a prince or a royal in the same family that, uh, that Christ, Adronicus, was. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty wild story, but how it, how it all kind of ties together in a weird Twilight Zone way. It's, it's super interesting. Yeah, I, I love it. I do. The idea is that, okay, those, those uh, books in the Tibetan behind the Tibetan wall. You know, what if those are confirmation points or will guide us exactly to the, the proper 
findings of Andronicus the Christ, if you will, possibly a Khan or a Tartar king. You know, I'm, that's what I'm beginning to think here because, you know, Fomenko's talking about Russia. He's talking about, you know, the Golden Horde, the White Horde, uh, the various hordes, but those are all part of Tataria. And we now have, um, book, well, at least the oldest book I can find was 1845 about Tartaria and the travels through Tartaria. And that's yes. 1845, you know. So I, I, I want to, you know, I, I believe that um, we're getting good parts and pieces of history. We're going to be able to put them all together and factualize our mankind's real story. This idea of um, a group of society, a, a group of people uh, that are ruling over the kings, if you will, which were basically governors or noblemen uh, during the Khan's period. Uh, these people were directing what everyone, how everyone should live, and we're still living that now. You know, so I don't, you know, Christ was crucified for what he did. Andronica was murdered for what he did, which was to bring hope or, or to bring more fairness to the people. You know, so I, I love the past and what it, you know, what we're learning now. And I love how it's, um, we're still fighting that. I love the idea that maybe this time around, we're going to be able to defeat it by finding the real facts. That might be way off. I'm sorry, but yeah, I do believe. <laughs> yeah, let me uh, let me just run through some of these parallels that uh, Fomenko uh, shows that are that are parallels between Kamenos and Christ. So, like the Last Supper, Kamenos himself had a meeting in a tavern with his supporters uh, right before he was caught, which is very similar. And he was kind of turned in by the um, the tavern keeper's wife uh, when he was. Captured, he was tortured in a way that very resembles the passion. He was dragged around with an iron chain, uh, just like Christ. Um, he had his eye damaged, yeah, eye poked out. And if you look at his trout turin, there's a debate about whether his eye is was missing or damaged. Also, Andronicus had his right hand cut off, and right. there there is several symbols in Christianity of a severed right hand holding the cross. What are the odds, right? The parallels, as you say, are. They're good arguments. They're good arguments of point here. That what we were taught, biblically speaking, is part of real history. But then the facts themselves. Okay, uh, I've seen that. And now the Shroud of Torin, that is Christian faith, right? Uh, Christian mm -hmm. I forgot what chapel that's in. I think it's in Spain. Turin's in Italy, I think. If it's, yeah. well, I got to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I think they. Have, they're trying to hide the facts by splitting by splitting the points of uh, government, if you will, with Christianity or with religions, you know, because it's a great way to control us. Yeah. You know, and I'm not I'm not doubting anyone's religion by all means, you know, keep the faith. Um, but at the same time, look for the facts, you know, and I I do think that. Fomenko's argument, and I think you're you're talking about that video that uh, that long video that Fomenko's partner just recently did, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the piercing or the the severed hand, uh, the puncture of the of the wound. Um, there's the cup that held the blood of Christ. You know, if that's mm -hmm. a real thing, there's stories of that in London as well. That it was that it was carried to London. Underneath the the, uh, the coronation chair mm. is the stone that supposedly Jacob had laid his head on, that okay. saw the dream, you know. So it's still government. It's still religion. It's still what we're dealing with. Well, it seems is that uh, the Egypt culture, a, lo a lot of Roman and Greek paganism, they are rooted in the Christ story. I mean, we're told today they came before and they had nothing to do with it. But this death of Christ created a sort of snowball effect, which led to the Mongol Empire, which led to the expansion of Tartaria. So when Christ died, it basically uh, created a sort of division within the empire. You had a, two factions. You had a pro-Christ and you had an anti-Christ, sort of uh, the, the nobility that it was against them. 
but then you had the, has the supporters that loved them and the family that that also supported them. So there was this kind of uh, civil war going on in the aftermath of uh, Christ's crucifixion that would lead to led directly to the Crusades, or or if you want to look at it the way Fomenko does, the Battle of Troy, that the crucifixion of Christ led directly to the 1204 sacking of Constantinople, Troy. which was which was Troy. Yep, yep. I firmly believe that. You know, when you look at Constantinople just on a map, you know, they talk about how Troy was self-sustaining. And, you know, with, with uh, someone had found uh, what they claimed was the uh, the walls of Troy. But when mm -hmm. you look at the inside, how could it sustain? How could it grow the food? How could it maintain uh, food supply, cattle, et cetera, et cetera, to withstand an army that's supposed to be battling them for 10 years? You know, just by looking at that, it was not possible. But then when you look at Constantinople and you see the mm -hmm. Trojan horse, uh, the the aqueducts that were bringing, you know, water in, the idea that it had farmland inside, uh, the idea that it was cattle there, that's, that to me was more realistic, the idea of Constantinople being the Jerusalem, you know, of the time. So, you yeah. know, that... I, I definitely look at that. I, I look at and uh, I look at Christ also as a child. The the kid was super smart. He was highly intelligent, mm -hmm. and when he was asked questions by the Sadducees and Pharisees, the the leaders of the um, of, of of Jerusalem, if you will, um, he answered their questions and created questions that they could not answer, and they hated him for it. You know, so you know, the 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 parallels are are amazing. Andronicus did do a lot for the people. Anyone that listened to him or followed him were amazed by what he had said. The miracles, I don't know, but I'm amazed by him anyways because there were tons of them. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that the Sadducees and Pharisees, the leaders of the uh, of the governments, if you will, did not like his answers and responses because he made sense and that was not acceptable <laughs> that's a threat right there <laughs> yeah <laughs> i had a question um you know we've seen a lot of <clears throat> tartarian discussions on social media um and it's being rolled into like a a lot of other cons you know it's being it's clearly being called a conspiracy theory it's it's getting kind of um, co-opted by various people who are trying to, you know, maybe monopolize or capitalize on it. Is there a way to separate the actual search for the true timeline of who we are from the topic of Tartaria? Or are they, are they intrinsically connected? You know, like, does one come before the other? Or, you know, how do you approach that? Okay. Point being is that there there has to be a way, and, and I think the uh, the Fomenko books kind of helped out. They use science, you know, both uh, solar, what the events that happened within the stars, when they talk about what happened with Egypt and the pharaohs that were buried, how they came up with where the moon, where uh, Mars, Saturn, Mercury was when the when the person was born and when he died, and they put that on the sarcophagus. That's something that we can actually search out and find. Solar events, if you will. Someone who, okay, like in the books in Tibet, if someone wrote, well, the moon was in Saturn, uh, you know, just like, just like I said about what was going on with the pharaohs and how they mm. created their birth and death model for the, for the person. If they started writing things or saying things in the same, uh, like the, the Mars was in Saturn, uh, Jupiter, you know, this or that, then we could be able to create timelines based on those. Uh, pretty accurately, right, JB? You can't really argue. Can't I know, argue. I know, I know what there's certain repetitions when certain planets are in constellations, but we have multiple planets in specific constellations that only happens once in a tens thousands, of thousands of years. Yeah. Two thousand, yeah, ten thousand years. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if there are people that were intelligent enough, and I believe there were, that would write like that and state things like that before they uh, went into their stories or after, then we can piece together those and use those as 
part of a fixed timeline. And then we might be able to enmesh all the other stories from the Tibetan library or from various other sources and match it up using the science, using mathematics and the solar, the, uh, the, uh, the movements of the stars, I think is our uh, great starting point, probably the best. It's also uh, something that I think can be um, explained to like the lay person that, you know, our lunar eclipses and solar eclipses are, we have the ability to predict these things down to the second you know, yeah. and that in itself is a way to kind of give people the evidence that, hey, you know, this is really a way to re reverse engineer our true timeline by using mathematics, astronomical physics, all, all the things that Flamenco has been doing. And now he's actually giving interviews and Gleb Nabosky as well is a co-author. You know, getting back to Tartaria, you know, you can show people these maps and what is your feeling and, and the importance of maps and, and the maps that you know these old maps i mean some people will say well we we didn't know as much then and they're just making stuff up and they get now that we have satellites you know uh those things don't matter but how important are those maps in your opinion very and the, the idea to think that we weren't intelligent back then is kind of a farce when you look at the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and understanding that there was a couple of 20 year olds that helped write that, I'm going, oh my God, you know, <laughs> look at us now, you know, <laughs> two plus two is five and, and people will believe it, you know. So when I think back about uh, the mapping, the, most of that was done by merchants, sea merchants, travelers. So they were they were, let's say, very strict about who saw them. They did not want them to be used or, or misused, and they were kept sacred. So maps to me, ancient maps were very important. Plus, we can also, with, with the maps that we've seen that show Tartaria, that the Maduro map. Um, the Frau Moro? Yeah, the Frau Ma, that thing is, I can't get enough of that map. And I'd like yeah, to get gorgeous. it in life size, but I don't have a house big enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, but look at the detail that thing had. And compared to what we have now, great, GPS and all this stuff, it's really groovy. But that map had history on it as well. And the, the idea about Italy and Rome not being there. Yeah. Um, that struck me. That struck me good. And it's like, how do you answer that? It's odd because it's almost the only place on the map with nothing on it. <laughs> right, right. Well, people and, people have been criticizing. We just did a video on that. And some of the critics are saying, well, Rome was so well known and it was, it, everyone knew Italy, you know, it, like they just left it out because everyone knew it already. You know, it's like, I mean, that's not yeah, an um, argument that makes no sense to me. It, it does. Yeah. That, I can see that as brushing off because it interferes with what they believe. And maybe it's a true historian, a guy who's gone to college and and memorized what uh, the history was. And this basically goes directly against everything, all education that we've been taught. So I can see where they would naturally gravitate towards a defense mechanism like that. But at the, at, I would look at it and go, well, if what you say is true about, well, everybody knew, then why wasn't that the most detailed part of it? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's the question that brings up uh, the doubt in a mind. And so an academic that say, well, everyone knew, well, then why wasn't that the center of the world? Like um, history, te uh, European history teaches mm -hmm. us now. Rome was the center of the world. No, it wasn't. You know, uh, we've got this thing here. We've got Tartaria. We've got the kings of, of, of London that are dressed just like Tartarians. You know, they, they have the same clothes makers. It, it, the, let them challenge. And, and you know, um, it's good that they do challenge and say, hey, you know, this and that, that and this. We keep moving forward. We keep asking questions. We ask questions upon their statements, and if they can't answer it, and I've gotten in a few arguments with people, 
uh, when I showed uh, uh, the picture of Jesus Christ with uh, St. Jerome, who had spectacles on. He goes, yes. well, St. Jerome was born in 300 AD. He wasn't part of Christ's death. This is just artsy work. Mm -hmm. They said, well, you know, okay, so, you know, we can look at that. We can approach this several different ways. First of all, if you believe in the Bible, you know, you have to believe that he was born and there's a supernova that found um, that was that was out and about day and night so bright that people mm -hmm. can follow it. And then 33 years later, the crucifixion occurred. You do believe in that? Well, yes, I do. Okay, then that means you are religious to the Bible, and that's a great thing. So where is it in history on the planet where there was a, a supernova and in 33 years, a total eclipse? You yeah, know, how many times has it happened? Right, right. And the Fomenko group found twice, maybe. Um, okay, so that's one way of looking at it. The other way is say, okay, um, let's ask the question, uh, you know, the common sense question is never asked. Who created this timeline? Who made up the decision that Jesus Christ was born in 0 AD and died 33 AD and the Council of Nicene occurred in 400? Who came up with those? Especially when, you know, zero was discovered by Fibonacci in 1200. Okay, so, and I cannot find any books that makes the, that that lays it out straight that says that here's how we came up with these dates. It's just implied. So who's to say that Jerome was born 300 years after the death of Christ? Where is that in any kind of writing? You know, okay, so, you know, I, I uh, this person didn't want to discuss anything with me anymore. It's like, well, I'm asking you good questions. Um, you, you're telling me Jerome was, you know, born 300 years after. The guy's wearing spectacles. Oh, that's just artsy. Uh, okay. That's a scientific okay. response. Yeah, yeah. But then we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these of great paintings, these great, this great artwork that is that is spent on the crucifixion, spent on the birth, and they have armor in it, they have top hats, they have castles or buildings that were definitely not made of clay. And, and this is all around 1100, 1200 AD. You know, Constantinople had windmills. They had windmills in the in the in the background, and that's Constantinople on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah the geography of these these artworks match it matches Constantinople more than it does Jerusalem almost consistently. Yes, yes. So there are ways. There are ways to cut through, but then, you know, right now, let's face it, you know, we're few, but I do believe in the, in the years to come, uh, people will be looking at history hat and people will be looking for people that have actually started digging in and maybe they'll start reading other books and start coming together and start putting this stuff together. We're breaking ground here. We're breaking some massive ground and I love you guys for doing this. I truly do. Yeah, you do feel like you're ripping a Band-Aid off so, of something that hasn't been looked at really by anybody. A big Band-Aid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's Everything fun, you know. Band -Aid. Pe people, I understand people are going to have a hard time with it and not get it as first and stuff. But that's just the way it goes. And, you know, we're happy to sort of fight that out as long as we need to. Yeah. Um, I think... How about, the, sorry, how about the pictures of, of the spaceships during Christ's crucifixion? That's another subject. Like, what? <laughs> well, speaking of spaceships, you know, we've been hearing a lot about disclosure uh, regarding ETs, or they just keep changing the definition of what these things, but let's just say ETs. Um, how do you think that ties into the bigger picture of, you know, Fomenko's work, the timeline, people being willing to, you know, that we're going through a transition, clearly, uh, in our world right now, you know, with the advent yeah. of certain technologies and obviously you see what's happening in the Middle East and people are questioning the history. People are arguing about whether Palestine existed or this existed or that existed. And I find it interesting because it's actually leading people to start looking back and, and really start analyzing what we've been told. Um, 
But I guess what I'm saying with ETs is uh, how do you think, you know, this idea of disclosure is going to maybe help the study of Fomenko's work and the study of Tartaria and study of alternative technologies. And, you know, it seems like a lot of this stuff is bubbling to the surface now and it's reaching like critical mass. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we have to bring in Mato Biglino and his, uh, by the naked, the Bible. naked Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And his writings, uh, that man is another one of those gifts uh, because he was able to correctly translate the Old Testament and the words El and Elohim instead of the word God. And it was to a point where he introduced it to the cardinals of Rome and also to some rabbis, and they could not argue the point. So El and Elohim, um, well, we can call them angels. You know, we see these things in our ancient, uh, what we call ancient, I should apologize for that, and for the mid, middle of uh, uh, medieval times about these uh, spaceships. What if they were aliens? You got to ask that question now. What if Jesus was a hybrid? You know, uh, and when you read the stories of Mary, uh, and I've, I've got several books uh outside the Bible that talk about the birth of Mary and how she was prepared for this birthing. Okay, so, you know, argumentatively, if you look at the Bible, you talk about it freely instead of verse for verse, what this person, what this chapter said. But if you look at the story, Mary was prepared for uh, a angel to come upon her at night. And, you know, Let's face it, you know, she was called the Virgin Mary, and if you are, ooh, um, okay, pardon me for the, if you um, do it with an alien, are you still a virgin? You know, uh, because you have to be, you know, if, if you're a virgin, then, then it has to be done by a man, uh, you know, a human with another human. And so it, it crosses that that kind of line, and, and what I see now is that it's quite possible that, you um, we might be talking about aliens coming in and doing this stuff. I do find it quite interesting how the timing is in our timing now that Mauro Biglino could bring this out. And from what I understand, he has taken the entire Old Testament and translated it properly. Because um, from Hebrew, and, and I'm not an expert on this, but from my understanding of what he was doing, he, um, Hebrew has singular and plural meanings in their writings but when it's translated to latin or english um they seem to mix them up or cross uh cross reference them or mix what should be plural becomes singular what is singular becomes plural and i'm curious what that means when i read it and i eventually will get all of his books and go through that too if if i can live long enough <laughs> you know <laughs> you know but as far as the alien thing, and then, of course, Cliff High, um, he's all over it. You know, I've been reading him for 20 years. Um, uh, I've been doing a lot of work in between some great people uh, with his works. And, and uh, I think there's more to what he knows than what he's saying. So I keep a... I, um, because of him, I've learned to keep an open mind. And also, as far as the language is concerned, to be very careful about what I say or how I say it. Because when I talk to Cliff, uh, if I say the wrong thing... Yeah, he'll, rip, he'll rip you new ones. <laughs> and, uh, I've got... I'm healing now you know, from, the, from, his, from his discussions. Yeah, and, you know, he he's a great guy. He really is. And I enjoy what he has... Uh, exposed or helped expose and he likes pushing buttons which is which is always fun to fun yeah. to watch he, he seems to know what to say just to get to get people oh, open yeah. <laughs> i just i just watched his uh recent uh bit shoot uh ai video explaining ai um he has such a wealth of information and it's just a lot of pleasure to hear his his take on things um yeah. it's so different it's so different from you know everything that we're getting bombarded with on a, on a daily basis um but it's kind of refreshing isn't it yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely 
but it can get people really upset. I'll tell oh, you yeah. that, you know, oh, yeah. just asking questions gets people yeah. upset. Um, a fam when it comes to family, they, you know, I go right over their head talking about Tataria, talking about history that's not been taught. You know, uh, one of our one of our friends on on the X Tataria, they came mm -hmm. up with. They said they've got seventy five hundred books on Tataria alone. And how can academia miss all of that? And how many books actually were saying the American uh, Indians were descendants of the Tartars and that all these different races and, and, and creeds that were among the Native Americans in these books, uh, just in black and white, and nobody, nobody talks about that. Right. It, it's like a, an undis, undisclosed subject. So while we're talking about it, like, <laughs> didn't they say there was the, the population of the United States before or North America before uh, the colonists started moving in? It was... Like ten, like ten million people. What the story is, the disease kind of went through, and like ninety percent of that was wiped out before we even got to them. Um, yeah. That's that's a crazy story. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or what happened, but it seems like there's a lot of mystery of what was going on it in the United States. It might inland. just simply be a story, just a story. I mean, I heard one person point out that um, you didn't have this kind of uh, die off when. When Europeans were going to China, so why would it happen when uh, the Europeans are going across America? Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to believe the numbers, especially when yeah. you have alternative. And, I, and I'm just guessing. I'm just guessing the numbers, but they're somewhere yeah. in that that general ballpark. What if it was a hundred million? You know, um, where would the bodies be? That's you that's know? a good question. Well, you we know. have all those mounds, which is a good place to. Look. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, good place to look. We have a mound here in Prescott Valley. That, kind of sticks out about a mile before the mountains start to hit. And I'm curious about that. So maybe one of these days I'll be able to head out there and maybe dig around, see if I can find one the Smithsonian didn't find yet. And I think I think also we can touch on this later, but you know, I, I the mountains around us are uh Chumash Native Americans. That's the story, right? And uh they were like a fishing and very like kind of like an agrarian peaceful people that's how they've been portrayed but there's places that we go hike to on a day on a weekly basis that are there's it's like i'd love to get a lidar and, and this comes down to like a bigger point of how ai and tools now like lidar on drones combining that with ai technology could give the everyday guy you know the independent researchers the ability to actually do archaeological surveys without having to like dig things because trying to dig up on a state park, it's impossible, you know? And, Agreed. uh, but there's areas around my house that I've been, I've been looking at these rock formations. I've been looking at these, you know, places where it's clear that there was big communities in these areas. And, and just the fact that we might have the chance to, um, do it ourselves, um, as the technology becomes cheaper, but like they just found a, big complex down in the Amazon, which was pretty incredible. I think it's going to be an awesome, exciting uh, time we live in, you know? I'm glad we all chose to be here. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the way I see that the future is going to be open for everybody, you know, once we get past what we're going through now. And I do agree with the archaeological digs. And there's a lot of people out there that have the questions want answers, but who do you turn to? Academia is useless when it comes to this stuff. So, and, and I love the idea of uh, uh, being able to x-ray um, Jurassic Park, the first one, where they had an x-ray to go over mm -hmm. the velociraptor and they just hit the ground to see what's underneath it. That's an ideal way of not disturbing anything, but being able to see what's down or underground. So even the mounds, things like that, we could search it out. Yeah, even in Mexico, uh, I think it was the uh, pyramid of Cholula. You also have Teotihuacan. You look at the photos of them in the um, in the 1920s, and they're they're covered in mounds of dirt, and they're not even that old. So who knows what's what's buried under there? They they might even be like 500, 600 years old from based on our timelines. You know, mm -hmm. you know so yeah, his history is changing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the weirdest thing to say, you know. 
at least what we were taught is absolutely false. And everything we're learning now are the questions that we have now. They, they're, they're bringing up more questions. They're bringing up um, more confused points. Anatoly Fomenko, his science, the way he looked at things, the way he grasped where the timeline was, we can actually be able to enhance that and be able to, you know, Troy, now it's argumentatively part of the Crusades, you know, uh, and, and to me, that's quite exciting. Like, uh, as more and more people get involved, and like with the 7,500 books, there's no way three of us or 20 mm -hmm. of us or 100 of us could go through them all and dissect it. But I think this is a great starting point where we, if people do get it, a thousand people or so, they read it up, they write uh, a thesis, People look at that. They look at the data uh, that's brought up, kind of like Anatoly Fomenko's uh, indexes in the back. You know, they're points of interest so we could dig into and mm -hmm. say, hey, this matches this. Yeah, and I think just him, it was over a, a thousand sources that he used for his books and stuff. And and what I like about the, how this is coming up now is that now we actually have the tools to kind of go through all this with sort of AI and technology. And uh, Fomenko did it the hard way. He did it with... Um, you know, form codes, and he had a team of students looking looking through all these books. But now, you can scan, you, you can analyze, you can data mine these almost instantly. So I, I'm kind of excited to see if that sort of comes to fruition. I know um, we talked on the, on X about a sort of I think it was a Tibetan uh, library that was found, where it was, it was just uh, scrolls stacked to the ceiling. So nice. so what did what did these things say? Oh, I can hardly wait. <laughs> You know, get AI right on that and start start translating. Be accurate with the translations. So let's dig in. The accuracy is a key, I guess. Uh, kind of learning with ChatGPT. You know, you know AI. Is, uh, no. AI is subject to this to the same uh, same flaws of, as people because it's programmed. It's not like as Cliff says. There's no such thing as AI. Really, it's just it's it's actually just really good programming, and it's kind of up to the whims of the people that program it. To, of how accurate it is. So it is kind of a, a double-edged sword right there. You always do have to be cautious. True, true. But still, to still. have AI go in there oh, yeah. and dig into it, uh, I I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. I just uh, I just got my uh, a new book. It's the first Bible. At least they claim it was. It was written in uh, 144 AD. And of course, we ask, how did they come up with that day? Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's claimed to be the first Bible, and it's supposed to be about Jesus, Jesus's writings himself and no one else. I haven't had a chance to even get into it. I'm still going through the Pascalia uh, issues in Book 7 on the Easter. The Pascalia is the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox version of the crucifixion of Christ. And they were more focused on that. The Council of Nicaea was more focused on the crucifixion. And when that occurred, then it was the birth of Christ. Okay, so there were certain rules that they had. And uh, back in those days, uh, I forgot what calendar it was, but they were trying to put it into uh, the Julian calendar. But they had to follow the cycles of the sun, the cycles of the moon. And when the new moon came in, uh, and, and they were trying to calculate all these, and and what Fomenko's team found out is there's no way that the Council of Nicene, claimed to be in 400 AD, could have figured it out because of, um, they missed quite a few mathematical points. So they calculated that they were, it was around 1200, 1300 AD when they started trying to calculate this. Mm. But their mathematics wasn't that good. Fibonacci came up with the sequence, the Fibonacci sequence mm. measures positive and negatives, fractions, et cetera, that came around the end of 1200. So their mathematics was um, not as advanced. So they tried to uh, work it through to 400 and they missed on many scales. Uh, so, and, and I'm trying to figure out exactly the, the, the uh, cycle of the sun, the cycle of the moon and, and how all that worked out. But, uh, I, Anatoly, the, these guys, they're amazing with their math. And I have to admit, I'm not that good at the math like they are. But uh, 
So I got stuck there. I'm, I'm trying to go back and, and, and follow up what they're saying and how they did this stuff. And I guess it is important because when it comes to the Jewish calendar, Passover occurred on one day. Christ was not supposed to be crucified on the Passover, but he did die during a full moon and a total eclipse. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the rules were written there. And how do you put it in the modern day calendar? So I got stuck. <laughs> I got stuck on that. I admit it. I mean, it's it's all very complicated <laughs> material. Like, you know, what has it been? Five years? It's still kind of blowing my mind every time you read it. <clears throat> uh, Especially I... academia. I mean, have you seen some of the meltdowns when he asks questions? Oh no. Uh, oh, I enjoyed the. Um, there was a couple of senior academics that uh, he had brought up to saying, "Well, if mankind was truly evolving from this planet." At what era and where on the planet would man be able to live naked? Exactly. We're so different than everybody else or every yeah. other creature. And so, you know, that just that just did not compute. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know, wow, to me, it's pretty damn good. I mean, why can't you answer that? You know, <laughs> is there is it true that there is no place on this planet where a man could could catch his food or be a vegetarian all his life picking fruit or, you know, not having to wear clothes, hmm. you know, uh, and there's really not much except for maybe the equatorial region, you know, but uh, then again, you know, probably have to have a spear, probably have to learn how to hunt and gather and maybe have a, a group of people to try to catch a deer or try to catch your meat. You know, so, yeah, I love his, whew, yeah, he's, I'm glad uh, I'm around to see him, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's and I think uh, what, what this is all hinting at is what if the aliens have been here the whole time and they're kind of in front of our face, <laughs> they're kind of in front of our faces with the, uh, you know, I kind of find it interesting that we have this one, uh, Fomenko talks about it and it's kind of obvious for anybody is that we've only had a few families ruling for years and they're obsessed with genetics. They're obsessed with their lineage. Uh, they're obsessed with keeping people that they consider inferior out of the bloodline. So what if we're looking at this whole time, what if we're looking at sort of, I don't know, hybrids, Yeah, you'd say, um, you, you know, we have these skulls that are uh, all throughout the world, you know, uh, per the Peruvian ones are famous and, you know, you skeptics say, you know, it's, it's head binding, but no, that doesn't explain the size. You can't increase the volume by what we're seeing just by changing the shape. And you know, there's other anatomical differences, like the uh, the missing of the sagittal suture on the on the crown. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another thing with the jaw, where where these skulls they don't have nerves that go through the uh, go through the mandible and connect. It's like a different structure of the jaw. And if anybody wants to learn more about this, uh, Brian Forrester. Has really gone deep with these skulls, and he actually paid to have them uh, DNA tested by UCLA, and they they turned out that these Peruvian skulls, a thousand years old, are from Crimea. Oh my goodness! Black Sea, yeah. So the oh, DNA geez. tested by 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 UCLA, by by Berkeley, and I think another lab in Canada. And yeah, they're human. They're not aliens, but they're not from Peru either. And how does how does that work? Yeah, they and, got there somewhere. But somehow, right? Yeah, it and might help prove that we've got a we actually had a shipping or a uh, a shipping line between the nations between the the continents long before uh, what they claim we had now. Yeah, it seems like it was it was connected a lot longer than we we know about. Think about uh, Christopher Columbus yeah. and uh, the the Pinta, the Nina, the Santa Maria, uh, and in Canada they have a exact replica of one of the ships and on the mast was Tataria. That's funny. You're, I'm looking at the picture right now from the okay. uh, from the mall of the ship, uh, the, yeah. uh, the double-headed eagle. Yeah. This thing was all over the world. And I know there's excuses like, yes, it was the Holy Roman Empire and stuff. I also, I have a map of Cortez from 1520 of uh, Mexico City, where that is under the banner of the double eagle as well. So... 
I lived in Alaska for about three months, and we saw the double eagle everywhere, which uh, I guess yeah. is a t- it's a tinglet symbol, and they're called lovebirds. And if you sort of read the history on it, it's nothing about Russia, nothing about the fact that Russia was in Alaska. Yeah, nothing at all. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, right. Or <laughs> oh yeah, that's the one. Face that... would be that it was a real uh, country, or it was a real government, if you will. It did control the entire planet. And I don't know how they were able to do that. How did an empire so broad, so wide, uh, become so big without a banking system? Yeah, that's for a future. Yeah. Well, I, I you no know, that, that actually that ties into a question I had um, relating to Rome um, and its coinage. Um, how big a role? Does currency devaluation, you know, play in the collapse of an empire? Um, are th- are there any other examples of empires collapsing due to this uh, devaluation? Okay, in the Roman Empire, no banks were around supposedly, um, and they started clipping coins. That was the thing. So if you had, uh, I'm just using a hypothetical one ounce uh, silver or one ounce of gold, they would snip a corner of it and save it. So maybe about 30 coins, they'd snip some and make another coin. So that's how they devalued that. And then eventually they started mixing um, metals together, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and then that was another way of devaluing. It was only after the mathematics came in, um, uh, Fibonacci and his sequences, that we were able to do fractional anything. And that's where we came up with fractional reserve banking. That was Medici. Uh, that was created around 1400, Medici Bank, which is still alive in Italy and thriving. Um, and then from that point, here, we're in our mess now. Um, you know, okay, when I go back and think about Christ's time, it was silver and gold. That was, you know, that's what they dealt with. Um, and it wasn't paper, like Tataria. It's hard to inflate it. Okay, so you can print the money, and that's what Kublai Khan did. Uh, he just printed the money whenever he needed it. So if, uh, if people would save, and I don't know how they would save back then. Did they save it in the paper, or did they buy assets, silver and gold? My thinking is they did buy silver and gold, but I don't have um, any literature uh, proving that. Maybe inside the Tibetan archive we'll find someone who wrote about how he saved uh, money for his family, you know, something, something simple like that, you know, would would break open a whole new subject for me, or a whole new uh, level, uh, a place to to find out exactly um, how they saved, how money was replaced, and in Marco Polo's writings, he talked about when the money got old and fragile, they would just take it to the printer, and they would get a replacement of it. So if there was a place that had a lot of silver, uh, it would be a lot cheaper. But if there was a place that had a lot of gold, silver would be be more expensive to get. And they might trade one for one, uh, ounce for ounce, or use this paper currency, this paper currency, uh, to do the swapping. Does that make sense? Um, Okay, so that's the ancient times. And when we bring it forward, we, we're dealing with mathematics. We're dealing with uh, uh, these fractions. When you go forward and you think about Isaac Newton, who was also a challenger of, of our history lines as well. Um, he was learning, I guess maybe he was called the father of geometry. You know, so um, as we advanced from this middle age, we started advancing in our maths. And I'm thinking that it's because of that that we've gotten into this mess here. It's uh, we're just printing money like Kubli Khan did, but then we've fractionalized it and made it um, a bigger problem. So are you saying we're uh, kind of at the end of an empire? Truly, the only thing we're gonna we're gonna have to look behind us and say that's when it ended. Right now, um, I cannot tell you uh, with with any reason, the value of the U.S. dollar, it's trading at a close today at 103.37. But what does that mean? You know, you've got six currencies supporting that. 
piece mm -hmm. and then all these other currencies that are inside it and all the other currencies outside that are all created to suppress the price of silver and gold. So, you know, uh, I do know, I do believe in my heart, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I do believe people holding silver and gold will make it through this transition. Uh, and I'm hoping that, in, you know, like in my career, I deal with leverage. And this is the part where the commodity trading mm -hmm. sector, we don't buy one share when we buy an option or we buy a futures contract, let's say it's silver, it's 5,000 ounces. So the banks, when, when the time comes, I imagine they're just going to simply get rid of their short contracts and just buy and make a ton of money uh, on the way up like some of us might, you know, and, and as the empire dies, they're going to, it, it's no different than um, the Weimar, uh, Weimar Germany, mm. except for, you know, uh, silver went to like over a trillion marks uh, an ounce. The only difference is they didn't have a bourse. They didn't have a, a leverage system like modern day, like we have now. So uh, just like in, in 1980, uh, when Jim Sinclair was running the gold market, um, they made, all the banks made tons of money uh, on silver and gold to cover the losses that they might have accrued on some of the other trades they were in. So when we talk about the death of this empire, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's just going to close down. And, you know, they're just going to close the market, fuck everybody all at once. And mm. I don't, you know, I don't necessarily see that um, in uh, in Weimar. You know, even though the money became worth less and less and less on a daily basis, you know, you might have to spend sixty marks on an egg when, like years before, is 0.15. You know, um, it still was a currency that transacted business in that nation, uh, and and I think that there's going to be some form of collapse, you know, definitely the ponds and, and shares and such uh, because the way things are set up. But I do think that like the U.S. dollar will still stay here and trade here. It just may not be acceptable in other countries. And can I go on a tidbit with crypto? Sure. Uh, sure. Okay. Love it. So let's say we have this breakup, Japan, Swiss, the Swiss franc, uh, the British pound, the European currency, uh, the loonie, these are all part of the U.S. dollar index. That thing breaks up, and, you know, then all of a sudden, all nations don't trust another nation and their currency. How do we transact business? And we already have a partial answer right now with the crypto market. Let's say we want to buy some, some car parts or something from China, but they're not going to accept the U.S. dollar anymore. They're not going to accept any other country's currency anymore. What do we do? And so the you know the point being is we already have something in place and that's the crypto market. China could say, well, look at, we're not going to trust your U.S. dollar, but we'll take um, Bitcoin or Litecoin or Ethereum, and we'll charge this much. And so all you do is you take your U.S. dollars, put them into that Litecoin or whatever currency they want, send it over to them. They'll send over the product. It beats the idea of sending a bar of gold over to oh, yeah. the country and hoping that they give you back your, the, the stuff you ordered. You know, so we have something in place if we just simply um, allow it. And it's based on math, on how, math. Much it's, how much it's going to inflate. That, uh, it, and to me, that, that breeds trust too. You just don't have the Federal Reserve kicking, yeah. out, kicking out more money every year and year. You know how much more Bitcoin there's going to be in like 10 years from now and so on. And I well, think it, it'll always have a value based on the, the amount of print of a country. Yes. Yeah. So it's still workable. And I know it's very uncomfortable. It's a new, it's a new idea. It's a new concept. It may not be for us, you know, um, older people, but it's up to the younger generations, the ones coming in, that's going to either accept it or not. Could you, you know, it's a, could you explain the CBDC versus Bitcoin, the the whole controversy or the what is the um, primary, you know, the pros and the cons of either of these systems? Okay, uh, I think I can. 
Uh, central bank digital currency still has allowed them to print as much money as they want. It still has allowed them to hide all the crap that they're doing. Okay, with uh, Bitcoin or any of these other crypto markets, that they're they're finite. Um, you want uh, to, you it's not you don't. Um, there are a number of currencies out there, cryptocurrencies out there that are finite. They're only going to make this much of that product. And so when, when you have a finite currency and an infinite currency that can be printed, you know, endlessly to stay in power, then the finite currency is only going to go up in value continually against the infinite. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what the central banks are trying to push is um, what, what they have already. We have credit cards, we have ATMs. Very few people use physical cash these days. And that's the system they want to keep in place. And, and they hide uh, what they're doing, the nefarious deeds that, uh, with the system that they have now. Money laundering, I imagine, is probably the biggest thing out there that could be done through uh, treasury instruments across the world. You, you buy U.S. treasuries, you convert them over to British treasuries, and you convert them over to another treasury. How many times around the planet before it's considered laundering? You know, um, and I'm that's just a thesis I have. I don't have any facts on that. There's no way to come up with that. But to me, um, the system is hidden. We can't see anything. Now, when you look at Bitcoin or you look at a finite currency and you see the wallets, uh, I don't have the right term for it, but there are websites that will show you when a, current, uh, when a crypto was purchased here and sent over to Italy or sent over to Russia or South America. And that's the, you know, people can actually see where that money's going. And in a, uh, in a finite system, and this is what I, Personally, I would love to see in the commodity sector and the, and the stock markets as well, you can see where the big money is going into a position or going out of a position. You may not be able to tell exactly who that entity is, but you'll, exact, you'll see exactly when it's coming in and maybe what the market is you know, moving at that time, whether it's up or down. And, and the blockchain technology is what uh, makes it even for large investors and small investors being able to, well, I want to look at uh, corn and I'm thinking that it's a, it's going to be a great buy position. Then all of a sudden you see the tons of trades going into that corn market, into the exchange. And then you see the market starting to drop and you're going, wow, what's going on here? But you'll be able to see it. And it might keep you from investing at that moment. And then maybe when it stops and you start seeing this money, leaving that core market you might want to jump back in or jump in and buy and ride the wave up. And, and this is, this is more fair in my mind than what we see now. JB, you bring up a good point about um, CBDC is being used to hide sort of the uh, malfeasance that's been going on. But a lot of, I want to kind of get into what, um, what a lot of people talk about CBDCs is the programmable nature of them. Uh, that that there's a lot of talk that you, you're going to have your purchasing power restricted. That the this money is is going to have restrictions built into it in a way that money has not had before. Like you're just not going to be able to spend it on something. You're going to have money that expires. Yes. So, well, you're talking exactly what happened in Canada with Trudy Trudeau. Oh yeah, with the bank accounts. You know, he he just punished everybody by just shutting off their bank accounts. And that, you know, I think that was a bit too early. Uh, for yeah, the, he kind of jumped the gun on that and uh, woke a lot of people up. He so sure I'm, ki I'm kind of glad he did it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he I, I think the, his, uh, the, you know, the World Economic Forum, because he's a member of it, I think they're going, oh, no. But, you know, Trudy. Not again, Trudeau. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not again. You lost uh, another eyebrow on that one, guy, you know. <laughs> but, uh it's hard to believe what you're hearing out of China, but it seems like China is a little further and already kind of implementing uh, this kind of stuff with their social credit score. And so it's, yeah. so the- Because they're communist. Yes, well, so is the World Economic Forum. Yes, um, yes. So there's a big fear that um, 
you know, if, if, if you get a foul of the government there, I mean, they already have access to bank accounts already, but they're going to, any money you have, you're not going to be able to spend it anywhere. Nobody's going to take right. it. Um, if you say something bad about this government, they will cut you off. And it keeps the little people in line. And, uh, you know, look at the, look at what's happening. Yeah. You know, um, okay. Over the past, 15 years. So, and I give Alex Jones a lot of credit for discovering Davos and the World Economic Forum. If it wasn't for him, none of us would see I do. If you If you watch his stuff from uh, 20 years ago, he sounds like a uh, prophet. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, just because everything you said came true, you know. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean you're <laughs> not close to you now. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I think the whole world, because of the internet, because of the freedom of speech that we have, uh, that we're still fighting for, obviously, um, I think more people have become aware of what's been going on with these central planners. And I think the central planners have lost it. And so, you know, they are cornered animals. They're going to react and, and they're going to try to lash out and do things. Um, but in one aspect, you know, it, they think they're going to be successful, but the more they lash out, the more evidence they prove to everybody else that they're losing. Uh, Davos just happened this past weekend, and basically Soros Jr. Uh, and some of the others have basically said that they don't have an answer for Trump. And it's like... Um, Wasn't there a cryptic assassination uh, yeah. tweet by Soros? <laughs> Forty-seven dollars and a yeah, bullet through glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't smart, but you see, this is their. This yeah, is their he, yeah he'll, he'll get away with it though. But then look at what happened with Millier, right in Argentina. Mm -hmm. He's warned his whole country. I'm printing fifty percent more money to get us out of debt, so get prepared. And and so I don't know exactly how he's going to get out, but I think he's got a plan, doubling up, uh, you know, increasing the money flow to get out of the debt, and then push out the bank might be something the rest of the world will be looking at. Do you think uh, Malay is for real? Um, you know, you just don't know. I mean, because these, the enemy of the people use, they, they'll kill family yeah. uh, to get what they want. And, um, you know. Uh, I think with that uh, Carrie Lake, we just heard something come out about uh, sort of a bribe and a, a death threat or something that was caught on tape. Yeah, yeah. She said that she told him to quit now. Uh, be, uh, you know, because she basically said, I got a lot more audio. And and I think this is wonderful. Carrie Lake was smart to record everything. Yeah. If, if she did record everything, she was smart to do that because, you know, like she when she told people, I, they tried to bribe me. And of course, mainstream media, the jack of nothing, uh, said, oh, that's just a story. You can't prove it, yada, yada, yada. And then she proved it a year and a half later. And then all of a sudden, we got a Republican National Committee member forced to quit. Now, he's a, obviously a uniparty member. How deep is the uniparty with, within our government? And, and Trump has been showing everybody how deep the swamp really is these past four years by letting the administration, the, this present administration, in. And I, you know, uh, I've watched Carrie Lake. I've actually met her, talked to her. It's it's an honor. Um, uh, she is straight, straightforward, and she can't be bought. And you know, I honestly believe that that's what we need in government. And uh, we're starting to see that. James O'Keefe, mm -hmm. you know, he's busting out other stories about how deep this swamp is and how they use uh, honey pots and sex parties to encompass uh, senators, vote voters. That's if you will on subjects. You've got Alex Jones, who's finally back on Twitter now, or X, and, you know, I don't agree with everything he says, but I still give him credit for introducing the world to Davos. And, and so, right now, we're we're in a massive change, um, and, uh, you know, I, I love Cliff's idea of hyper novelty, the idea of everyone's waking up at the same time and soon we're all going to be able to talk about what you and I are talking about now more freely. Family members are going, well, yeah, that's right. You know, he did rig the market. He did the, the, do this. He did rig the election. You know, Fannie Willis is obviously 
a racist <laughs> for calling everyone who 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 was investigating her a racist. You know, um, yeah, I think we are waking up. I'm glad we're part of this. Um, and going back to our history, uh, I think we're going to find out a lot more, and it's going to make a lot of people more uncomfortable. But at the same time, just remain calm, look at things, uh, absorb it. We'll figure it out. We're human. What do you think about, um, I've been wrestling with this. Um, as this, let's say mainstream academia actually has, is just forced to address Fomenko at, at some point it, within his, within like mainstream historians and stuff like that. I mean, what is the impact on society? What would be the impact on our society if it were the case that people said, okay, look, Fomenko is, this is more accurate. This is, this is the chronology. There's an acceptance at least of maybe not the whole series, but some of the key points of the series. I mean, how do you think understanding our past um, can help us going forward in 2024? Ooh, that's almost spiritual. I uh, love that. Um, okay, we have to know our past in order to move forward into our future. So if we found out that we were actually placed here, mankind didn't evolve, that, that we were actually put here to, to do a certain job and were left behind, I think that would have a major impact on our future as far as, well, how do we get off this crazy rock? You know, where did we originally come from? You know, so um, if if I see it being very difficult for mainstream academia to accept it at, at present right now, but in the future when they won't be able to deny the science behind what Fomenko has found, and they might start relooking. I think actually we're going to probably have to have a new set of teachers, new new set of academic study, um, not funded by big profit organizations, you know. Um, I think that's probably the best way. And like right here, right now, we're, what we're discussing, this might be new to everyone else, and it might set a foundation for them to start with, you know, um, and then be able to turn around and come up with other ideas that add to what we've been adding to. Yeah, I still got, I got books from uh, Time Life magazine, you know, back in the 70s. Those collections were huge. The Western edition, the Americas. And even though I, I know now that the what was written is false, the pictures, you know, paint a thousand words, just like what we're discussing earlier with uh, the, the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, and Andronica's story of Constantinople and Crimea. You know, the pictures might be able to help, which is why I keep these old, uh, the older books. Well, I think whatever happens, JB, it's going to be a, a grassroots sort of effort. I, I don't see the top accepting this at all any anytime soon in, in this in this paradigm, at least. But you know, but with X and sort of social media, I think that the way is just you just nibble away and try to bring as many people onto your side as possible. And honestly, that's, I think that's all we could really, really do. I'm not, uh, personally, I'm not, uh, I don't speak for Scott, but I'm not expecting, um, academia to wake up one day and realize that we've been right about this or that Fomenko has been right about this. I just don't think it's going to happen. I'd like to think maybe one or two, maybe 20,000, you know, small odds, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, well, cause they studied so hard. I mean, they went to school, oh, yeah. they memorized the years, the era, et cetera, et cetera. And then now to be told that everything was a lie. Uh, okay. Good luck. You know, <laughs> there would, there would have to be some massive, like collective humility in, in, yes. huma in humanity in general, which, you know, if there is going to be some disclosure event um, of obviously the WF crowd is, you know, scheming their, with all the think tanks to come up with their next uh, social experiment. But one of those could be, uh, you know, who knows, maybe there will be an event like that, that is just 
to, and then that will open the gates to other theories, uh, such as Fomenko's, you know, work. And maybe that's what's going to be needed to happen. Um, and maybe as the financial, you know, as, and maybe that coincides with the idea of um, the currency being devalued to the point where people aren't, can't, the government has to lay off a bunch of people. They can't afford, we can't afford like the new system that comes in. Is not going to allow for this kind of bribery and extortion? And it's going to, there's going to be a more transparent um, financial system, which then will support more uh, honorable people in the government, because there won't be the opportunity to, uh, you know, grease the skids. Of, of everyone to keep them quiet or to, you know, push an agenda. But we have a government that has more employees than we have in anything else. We have large corporations that are created overseas that are producing things and they're making money off the exchange rates. So when Trump came in, he tear up the daylights out of various nations, Italy being one of them for not allowing our vehicles over there or various other things. Uh, and China as well, when it came to our farming stuff, those are the right things to do. We have a um, we have a bloated federal agent uh, government uh, that you know has not been forced to um, modernize itself. So you know why do we need so many people involved with the mortgage to buy a mortgage when? When a person wants to buy a house and pay cash, she still has to wait a month or two for all the paperwork to be uh, pushed through. Why? You know, why do we have so many people that are making money off of that transaction when it could be just when it should be just artificial intelligence? You know, this guy just bought it. Okay, we have the keys right here. Here's the deed. Boom, you can move in tomorrow. Uh, there's various other things, construction, um, the the ideas of. Uh, having to get all these different licenses for doing this or that, um, all that is, a, it, it should be AI. It should be, you know, they, they should be getting rid of the, the people and replacing it with artificial intelligence that just does the processing. You know, um, that's the way I see it. And I think that's the future. And once we start streamlining things, then we're going to be able to allow the more creative individual to come up with a, an idea, you know, what, look at the Wright brothers, you know, a prime example, they were bicycle shop owners and then they created an airplane to fly. You know, how many more people are just waiting for a chance to come up with something creative and, and to, to start a new business, to start a new enterprise? And under the present conditions where you have to get permission from people who don't do anything to do something that you know how to do, it's ludicrous. So I, I think, uh, you know, that we're going to have, uh, we're going to be letting go a lot of federal employees. It has to happen, you know, um, both the nefarious ones, the initials, if you will, um, they've proven themselves not to mm -hmm. be working for America. The, they're working for somebody else. They're like the opposite of what the name says. Like the def it, defense is not defense. Justice is not justice. It, it's, it's a very Orwellian inversion of. Amen. All of that's got to change. And I think that's what happens when a uh, currency gets, you know, crushed. And, and right now we've got inflation. Uh, I think in December, the uh, food inflation was up three and a half percent. You know, and that's, you know, that's pretty heavy. You know, and when is that going to stop? And how can that happen? How can we have inflation if the dollar's not moving in price on my board? You know, <laughs> unanswerable questions is because when the government's involved, and Millier said this, you know, there's there's a there in a free market, there's always a buyer and a seller. But when a when a government comes in and, and intervenes, it causes problems. And then when you learn to master causing problems, you have an answer. The answer is from academia, um, uh, monetary academia. I know, let's print money. We'll call it not quantitative easing this time. You know, but still the answer is the same. They print more money. They bail themselves out. 
we eat the, you know, we have to deal with the inflation of it. And all that goes away with the new government or lesser. I mean, some have said that the reason why China is, you know, um, on a on a trajectory to basically become the 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 next big superpower is that they are their government has a lot of engineers. They have a lot of engineers. They have a lot of, and they have plans that they're enacting. They're very quick at getting projects off the ground, building nuclear power plants, coal plants, you know, energy infrastructure. All that stuff happens in a much uh, more progressive manner, even though that technically there is, a, you would say they're communists, but I find, I try not to fall into too much of the hate China thing, because I think there's a lot we can learn from them, especially when it's related to going back to this history of Tartaria and Katay and the fact that Russia and China are now basically have been pushed together in this, because of Ukraine. So it will be interesting to see how Americans are willing to kind of work with China in a different level, other than just relying on China for all our goods um, and our manufacturing, you know? Well, China has its own issues, you know, um, and we have ours. Mm -hmm. And we've been witnessing uh, the escape of manufacturing of the United States since Nixon started making friends with Henry Kissinger, did he, mm -hmm. got us off the gold standard, put us on a floating money standard. Um, and I think, you know, no offense to China, but we need to bring back manufacturing here. We used to make awesome TVs. We used to make really good refrigerators. I mean, there are some still around. They're 50, 60 years old, and they're still chilling, you know. Uh, so we need to get back our American ingenuity. And with that, you know, we'll be, be able to build our own economy. And I think what's happening now is this new world order. Nobody wants a one world government. They want their own sovereignty. They, they, want, they want to be counted. So China's going to probably, and right now they're having some real economic problems, you know. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, they're collapsing. Uh, their stock market started last week, I think, Thursday. And they they made it illegal to short sell, and they didn't stop the guys who were already long the shares and, and selling them and dumping them. So, and it, um, there might be engineers, they might be well educated, uh, but remember, education got us here. Good point. Uh, you know, yeah, and so that's a we, good point. We need to. Why don't we have anybody in the governing bodies that is not educated, but well-versed in the subject. You know, why can't you find, you know, there's a lot of people in the commodity industry and the stock industry that didn't get degrees, but they understand the inside and out. Why are they not part of the governing body and regulatory system? Is it because they're not educated? Yes. So the idea of education right now, um, let's look at it. It's the reason why we're in this, this issue right here. Well, education's so, kind of become adherence to the structure, kind of. That's yeah. what the education has become. And if you pay enough, you can have any degree you want. Yeah. You know, basically, there's going to be a rebalance. And China is, let's face it, a huge population. Um, they're great people. You know, the, the overall, you know, I've, I've had some con many conversations with Chinese, uh, American-born Chinese, um, and I've seen a, I've seen and met a few of the uh, native-born Canadians, NBC, ABC, the, you know, um, and these are great people, you know, uh, but they just live under a regime that doesn't allow freedom of speech. Yeah, and it um, seems to be getting worse. And you yeah. kind of hope when you look at it, China, that it's not a template for us. Kind of, it's it's kind of looking sure. at this as as the proving ground for the plan for for the West. Yeah, it looks like we're we're looking in a mirror, or yeah, <laughs> it's it's terrifying, and um, yeah, hopefully enough people fun. see it before it gets too far down the line. I think it is, and this is why I see the World Economic Forum. They're failing at every turn, you know. So, um, you know, we're going to have a great balance, a rebalance. We are going to go through a global currency correction that um, 
many are not prepared for. You know, so uh, what happens um, when you have a whole bunch of money and all of a sudden you become poor? Well, some people will just quit and, you know, kill themselves. Others will have a great awakening and become more family prone, you know, more, more to, you know, getting involved with the community. And, and that's where I think everything, everyone's going to be gravitating towards anyway in the near future. We're all going to be getting, we're all stuck in this. So how do we get out of it? We work together. We find a problem. We come up with a solution. Who knows? The guy down the street might solve a problem of plumbing, you know, or the water irrigation system if everything gets shut down. He might have a simple remedy. And, and you know, so this is where creativity will come in once again and be allowed. Um, and then we'll come up with new ideas. Maybe the suppressed technologies that we've been hearing about will be let out and start really changing you know, back in the past, we had points of energy. This is where Tataria came in as mm. well, right? They were able to heat large buildings with yeah. antenna up in the air. And, and then, so you don't see fireplaces on these cathedrals. No, I, but I'd love to. I'd love to feel what it's like. You know, uh, don't get me wrong. I love a great fireplace. I really do. Mm. You know, <laughs> uh, that wood burning smells great and it mm. feels good. But then. What kind of a feeling does Tatarian warmth have? A Tesla, the Kola Tesla was, I think, real close to introducing it to us. With this tower that uh, I think Westinghouse destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe someone's got that technology. Maybe when all this collapses, uh, maybe we've got a hacker that finds a, a missing page that enlightens somebody. And all of a sudden, we got a new direction. Right now, as far as the markets are concerned, there's no new must-have product. You know, oh, we got a new upgraded cell phone. Instead of 13 pixels, it's 13.2. You know, mm -hmm. you know what good is that? You know, so when we when this currency system does correct, um, I think that you know people will be getting together locally, you know, creating communities, starting small businesses allowing small businesses to employ more people, get rid of these monstrosities, uh, you know, intercontinental companies, if you will, and uh, go back to the basics to start. I mean, it's going to be a rocky few years, but there's a, there's a lot of hope. Yeah. That's the way I see it. And we've been going for a private about almost two hours. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Well, Flies by. I, know. Fun. Yeah. I guess we'll wrap it up. And, I, you know, we just want to say thank you for it. Uh, for finding us and interacting with us. Uh, we appreciate like all the, uh, the retweets or the re X's oh. and our interaction on Twitter with a great time. I love you that. guys. I do. Let's face it. I know. And I do think that our Twitter group is going to grow. Just continue I do. To grow. I, I, I feel it. I feel, I feel there's something percolating under, under the surface there and hopefully and the way, it, it, it can stay but, free. I, I'm, I'm waiting for Cliff to get kicked off any day now. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> the can, well, canary of the coal mine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's, well, remember, is X is about freedom of speech. Supposedly. You know, you know, so yeah, yeah. You still can't say anything about, you know, um, the confused ones, mm -hmm. you know. But still, it's more freedom of speech, and that's why Davos hates it, and that's why Cliff's on it. But then again, you know, there's so many different other uh, points of communication. Uh, you know, when he was kicked off before Elon bought uh, Twitter, you know, he was on Telegram, True mm -hmm. Social, and those are other platforms as well. So if he gets kicked off, then I'll be saying, hey, he's over here. Because, you know, yeah. I've got six monitors. I've got, I've got social media. Yeah, he's, got, he's got Substack too, I believe. Yep, yep. Oh, he does great with Substack. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, uh, so. and BitChute too is a good one. Hey, any you guys, anytime you guys want to talk about this, yeah, we, we could go on for a long time. I think you got, you gets, got someplace it, to be. It gets a little lonely out there when, you know, you get, you get, you can get, uh, gets intellectually lonely. <laughs> you can't, because you can't even pierce these subjects, you know, without getting immediately. And, and in California, it's an extra layer. Yeah, difficult. it's an extra layer. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, California. Yeah. yeah it's, it's beautiful, but it's, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> I was born there, uh, Medina, uh, 
And you guys just posted in Medino County. Uh, Mendocino County, yeah. Mendocino County. I was born in Redwood City, same area. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That, you know, um, I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's a shame. I don't I don't want to give this up to the, you know, to the World Economic Forum and China <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so California is well, worth fighting for. Well, once they once they figure out that they can't afford it without being printed, once the printing stops, um, freedom will come back. It will come back. Yeah, that's what we're hoping for. I, yeah. I believe that as well. Love you guys. You truly yeah. do. All right. I love you too, JB. Thank you so much yeah, again. We'll, again. We'll do this again, dude. I look forward to it. Truly do. Okay. All right. Cheers. Take Have care. a good one. Thank you for watching. If you want to support our shenanigans, head over to historyhacked.com slash shop for fantastic deals on exclusive Tartarian clothing and accessories. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and stay in the loop by following us on X at History Hacked. Until next time, stay curious.